experiment, so I've asked a few people to join me as volunteers. We've got Alicia and Seth, and I think Steve is out there somewhere, and there's Kristen. Okay, come on up, you four. All right, and I'd, all, I'd like all of you to participate as well, so please join in on this little experiment. We're gonna start out with a guided visualization, okay? So I'm gonna ask you four and the rest of you to just briefly close your eyes and take in a nice deep breath and relax. And I want you to think of one of your favorite mountain places, somewhere that's beautiful, where there's fresh air, it might be snowing or it might be sunny. Wherever that special mountain place is for you, just be there right now. Soak it all in. What does it feel like to be there? Now, I, wanna, I want you to come up with one word that just describes how that place makes you feel. How would you describe it? How does that place make you feel? What's one word? All right, thanks. Now you can open your eyes. That's great. Awesome, happy. And let's hear it from our volunteers here. What is your one word? Peaceful. Peaceful. Majestic. Majestic. Inspiring. Inspiring. Uh, connected. Connected, that's great. Thank you so much. It was a little bit of an experiment to see if these were positive emotions that our mountains give us, and sure enough, they are. It's great, thank you so much. So I'm gonna take a little detour from some of the things that you might have heard um, today in the talks and talk about a topic that's a little bit different. I'm gonna talk about how you can take these positive emotions, this great energy, and sense of positivity that the mountains give us to create solutions for over-tourism. So mountains are great for our individual sense of well-being, but they're also important for life on Earth. Mountains are the water towers of the world. They give us 60% of Earth's fresh water resources. Mountains are home to half of the world's biodiversity hotspots. They're also where many of our protected areas and natural, national parks and cultural heritage sites are found. And they're also where we have many forests, where all of the air that we breathe is coming from. So mountains are not only important for our individual positivity and sense of well-being, but also for life on the planet. And at the same time, many of our mountain communities and destinations are at risk. Their ecosystems and communities are at risk due to the threats of over-tourism. So let me tell you a little bit about what I've seen. I live in a mountain destination that's about 100 miles due west of Denver. And in the early 60s, my grandfather moved there and opened the first ski shop. And then he started the first, was on the first Vail Town Council and, and helped start the fire station. And I was so lucky to grow up on a little street named Beaver Dam Road. And I spent most of my time skiing, playing in the snow, building forts, climbing trees, playing in the meadows and streams. It was an amazing way to grow up. But over time, I saw more and more of those beaver ponds and wetlands getting filled in to build larger and larger homes. I saw my play areas paved over for parking lots. And I saw heated, I saw dirt streets get paved and now that we have heated streets. So I've seen a ton of change there. It's been crazy, it's been a wild ride. And for a while, when I was younger, I got really upset with all of this. I was pretty distraught, I was sad, I was angry, I didn't know what to do about it. That change for me was just too much. But then I observed what was going on around me and I saw some good things too and I decided that either I could fight against that change or I could be part of the shaping the change and making positive change in our destination. So I started creating educational programs to get people outside and connected with nature 
um, to help them learn about the mountain ecosystems. And I started an organization called Walking Mountain Science Center with a mission to awaken a sense of wonder and inspire environmental stewardship and sustainability through educational programs. And it's been a great, rewarding experience. Today, I also serve on our local city council. And I keep hearing more and more about this over-tourism and these different phenomena. Just about every single council meeting, we hear from somebody who's got some kind of complaint related to over-tourism. There's Rondi, a mom with young kids who fears for the life of her children because of speeding rental cars and resort shuttles going up and down the road where she lives, trying to look in vain for a parking space at a very busy trailhead. There's Greg, who's a local fly fisherman who complains about the decreasing trout population because of all of the urban runoff from the busy streets, the fertilizers and pesticides that are running into the stream. There's Anne, the local bird watcher, who complains that our infrastructure projects to help improve the quality of the stream are scaring off one of our only pairs of peregrine falcons. There's Mike, who owns restaurants, who can barely keep his businesses alive because he can't find employees because there's no housing. We keep losing more and more of our local housing to uh, part-time homeowners and short-term rentals. It's a crisis situation right now. And there's Bill, the longtime wildlife officer, who tells us we've lost 60% of our deer and elk herd in the last 10 years because more and more people are going into the backcountry 24-7, and the animals are stressed out by this. They can't get away, and it's really decreasing their survival rates. So these are just some of the examples that I have, and I'm sure that you might have some of your own. And mountain destinations are particularly challenged because we're in narrow valleys. We have limited water supplies. We have limited spaces. And it's really tough to keep up with those infrastructure needs to handle more and more tourism. So what is over-tourism? It's not just overcrowding. It's a much more complex and contentious issue. The Center for Responsible Travel defines over-tourism as tourism that has moved beyond the acceptable limits of change in a destination due to the quantity of visitors, resulting in degradation to the environment and infrastructure, diminished travel experience, wear and tear on built heritage, and the negative impacts on residents. So it's a very complex and contentious issue and not easily managed. We don't really keep track of the full cost of tourism. There's a recent report from the Travel Foundation that calls this the invisible burden of tourism where the hidden costs of tourism are borne by the municipal governments and residents to provide more and more infrastructure. And the way I see it is there's a tipping point. At first, tourism's awesome because you're getting more sales tax, you're getting more lodging tax. But at some point, it tips, and you're dipping deeper and deeper into your capital funds and your reserves and maybe taking on debt so that you can keep up with that, that need for more infrastructure. You also start beginning to sacrifice your open spaces and wildlife habitat for more infrastructure. And the locals just start throwing up their hands and saying, I can't find a place to live. I can't really feed my family, so I'm going to take off and go. And I think that preventing these things in the first place is going to be much easier to do, much less costly than letting it happen and having to deal with it afterwards. So how can we? use that inspiration we get, the creativity, the innovation, the positive energy that we get from mountains to help create solutions to over-tourism. Because I think over-tourism can actually be one of our greatest sources in the travel and tourism industry for innovation. I think each one of you can come up with ways to integrate ideas and solutions for over-tourism. And I've been thinking about this a lot. I've been studying academic journals, reading reports, talking to people, and implementing solutions in my own hometown. And it boils down to four things I think of, four things that you can just get started with right away and take a leap in and start creating solutions to over-tourism. First, L is for lead. How can you lead and start getting going on creating solutions? How can you take your own strengths, gifts, talents, how can you empower others that you work with 
to think about over tourism. It might not be facing you right now, but you can get a head start and lead. Second is envision. Can you imagine that place that you went to in the beginning of this presentation with over tourism there if we don't do something to stop it? Can you imagine the maybe degradation to the forest, the streams, the wildlife, whatever it might be where you were? And now can you envision a better future? Can you envision solutions that are in place so that place can be sustained for future generations? Third is A for adapt. How can you adapt your current work, your data technologies, your management systems to help prevent over tourism? How can you um, create powerful metrics and monitoring systems to help measure and track more than arrivals, head, heads and beds, rev bar and, and ticket sales? How can you reveal the hidden costs of each traveler, ensure there are enough resources to go around? And fourth, P is for partner. Who else do you need to work with? Who, who else do you need to collaborate with and to help fix those disconnects between those in sales and marketing and those in destination management and stewardship? Because it's going to take everyone to solve this very complex problem. So there you have it. You can lead, you can envision, you can adapt, and you can partner. You can leap in right now. It's urgent. We need your help and help prevent over-tourism in the future. So now, before I close, think back to that beautiful mountain place that you thought of in the beginning. Breathe in that inspiration from the mountains and think about how that can be a source of energy for you to work with the mountains, work with the destinations, and help prevent over-tourism in the future. Thank you.